so welcome everyone. Um, this is going to be uh, the last, I think this is the last virtual panel of the academic year that the research advancement team are gonna be putting up. So first, I wanna thank everyone uh, for coming to attend uh, this virtual panel, but especially our guest speakers, um, Sarah Suzuki and Yam, uh, Yasmin Irizari. Uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Suzuki, who's at uh, Tufts, right? I'm gonna be reading this bio in a second. Uh, and the same thing for Yasmin, Dr. Yasmin Irizari. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about today, and one of the things that I've been um, participating in as well, talking with about with uh, Sam, as well as other faculty here, um, at Sanford is how we think about quantitative methods. Um, I've been talking about that also with uh, a number of the graduate students um, in this school and how do we think about these methods, or these quantitative methods more critically, especially in this moment in time and not only thinking about with racial equity, but in terms of how do we think about quantitative methods critically across a number of domains, right? Another, a number of data, a number of surveys, a number of ways of even thinking about analyses and to how do we think about these analyses and how do we think about this idea of generalizability, all these things that are at the core of what the guest speaker is gonna be talking about and the idea behind um, quantcrit, this idea of thinking about quantitative methods more critically as us as, um, as scholars, as well as scholars and teachers who are instructing our students about these methods, right? And how to think about uh, survey data and secondary data analysis and all of that. So that's the hope of this panel. And that's why uh, we are very uh, thankful for our guest speakers to what I often like to say is drop the knowledge uh, for us um, and for our, our faculty, staff and SSFD community. Oh, as well as I think I also extended, there's some, there are gonna be some participants outside of SSFD, I think, um, since I'm split between um, the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, I'm gonna be, I invited some of those as well. Oh, and by the way, my name is Anthony Figueroa um, and uh, Sam Breyer, who's also been part of the research advancement team. And Paul is also a part of it, but I don't think he's here. Um, we put this collectively together, so I also want to thank them. So anyway, so introductions for our team panelists. Uh, Dr. Yasmin Arizari is an uh, assistant professor of African-American and uh, African and African-American di diaspora studies at UT Austin. Now, I want to also congratulate Dr. Arizari, who's recently gotten word. Is that okay to, to, to state that? Okay, who's recently that you are now going to be associate professor of, with tenure at University of Texas Austin starting in, the, starting in August. So congratulations. Um, Dr. Arizari is a quantitative sociologist by training with research interests in social of ed, race and ethnicity, sexuality and queer studies, social inequality and intersectionality. Her research, which examines issues related to inequality in elementary and high school contexts, racial identity, the quantitative measurement of race, social attitudes and prejudice and discrimination has been supported by, has been supported by funding from the Ford Foundation and the American Educational Research Association. She is currently working on research support by a research grant from, the, from AERA that focuses on disparities in the ninth grade and ninth grade math course placements at the intersection of race and gender using nationally represented data from high school longitudinal study of 2009. Um, Dr. Sarah Suzuki is a postdoctoral researcher uh, center for, at, who's at the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement at Tufts University. Dr. Suzuki is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement in the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts, and Dr. Suzuki's research on the development on young people and sociopolitical actors who resist and challenge systems of oppression. She employs the theoretical frameworks of critical consciousness and positive youth development in her work and um, employs cross-sectional and longitudinal mixture modeling techniques to uncover patterns in how young people bring about a more socially just world. At the center, uh, she partners with organizations to facilitate uh, transformational changes in the many <clears throat> civic areas young people are engaged in, ranging from elections and running for public office to community organizing and movement building. So thank you both to Yasmin and to Sarah for joining us and uh, sharing some of their experiences as well as their knowledge and their research 
Um, so what we're going to do first is have Yasmin pre present first, and then we'll go over to Sarah. Uh, we're going to have about 15, 20 minutes, and then at the end, we'll have uh, a Q&A session. So if you're ready, Yasmin, I think you're a co-host, um, so you should be able to uh, share the screen, um, and we'll move forward. So thank you. All right, give me one moment. I'm going to see if I can get this to share. Let's see. Um, all right. And then I've got my notes. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I do want to mention, I, I made the mistake of, of not sending my bio on time. So I'm, I'm a little bit further along in my research that he mentioned at this point and have had some more funding since then. But um, what thing, one of the things I've learned is I've gotten closer to full is that my plate is extremely full. And one of the low priority items is actually updating my bio on just about anything. So um, with that aside, I also just want to mention I've been sick for the past week. So bear with me as I'm going through this because I've kind of just starting to feel better and um, I'm still a little bit kind of not feeling great. So I'll do my best with that. So with that today, um, first of all, I want to thank um, Anthony, thank Sam for inviting me today to present um, on uh, numbering race and racism, um, applications in quant crit. I do wanna mention, I really started doing this work before this language existed, before we really, before people were writing about it. And so I'm gonna write from that lens because, or talk from that lens because um, there's a lot of really good work, um, some of which Dr. Suzuki is gonna be talking about in a little bit, but I want to at least bring some perspective based on some of the ways I was thinking about this when I was doing my work and there wasn't a literature to draw from, but there was a, a you know, a long history of this work, going back to Ida B. Wells, right? So this is, it's not new work, but we finally have like a language for it. So with that, let me see if I can, um, get this to skip, there we go. So I wanna talk about a couple things. Um, and I'm gonna start out by just talking briefly about some foundational things. The first thing is about this idea of quantitative research and its, um, and its connection to white supremacy, right? So quantitative research has been used, uh, um, has been uh, used to serve white supremacy in many ways through tools, models, and techniques that fail to account for racism as a central factor in everyday life, through ideologies of neutrality in education in particular, through meritocracy and other things that camouflage racial interests and through lending supposedly objective support to Eurocentric white supremacist ideas. This is in, in my area of research and education. This is pretty rampant. It's used to support deficit theories, uh, um, to label teachers, schools and districts and even whole countries as successes or failures to justify all kinds of education policy and to expose or change failing, uh, failing you know, schools at the expense of minoritized communities. Right, and so um, some of the, the, the kind of disconnect between quantitative, traditional quantitative research and what we would think of as quant crit is really about these competing research paradigms, positivism, post-positivism, um, uh, and then just kind of critical paradigms. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but I do just wanna bring it up br briefly because it really matters for thinking about uh, critical quantitative work. Um, most people that are trained quantitatively are trained with positivist views, this idea that we're being very scientific, right? And that we can be ob objective. There's an objective reality. We're here to reveal it. We somehow can come as a neutral source with no you know, background, orientation, experiences, and that we are going to reveal something about this world. Mm -hmm. And thus the things that we find are value free. Right. Whereas when we get to post positivism, we start thinking about this idea that there, there's a reality, but it's really imperfect. We know it only probabilistically. It's really socially constructed in many ways. Right. Um, and how we understand it is even about our perspective and our view. And so because of this bias, you know, it's undesirable, but it's inevitable that we are going to have that introduced through our own lenses, our experiences, and also the work that we do. And so it's really important to think about detecting it and trying to correct it as we do this work. And also thinking about the values and beliefs that influence our research through all different kinds of things that you'll hear about in a little bit. But where critical uh, race kind of uh, uh, critical race approaches veers is that critical race, in addition to 
being post positive is also emphasizes the importance of um, centering race and racism, uh, thinking about um, centering assets instead of deficits, overarching structures of racism, and how these things impact our framings, our interpretations, our approaches, and, and so on. So um, with that, really one of the core themes then is the centrality of racism, right? This idea that racism is complex, it's fluid, it's changing. It's a characteristic of society that is not automatically or obviously amenable to studying with statistics. So in the absence of being a, a race conscious quantitative analysis can remake and re-legitimate the very inequalities that people want to study. And this also is um, present, these kind of competing paradigms and the centrality of, of racism is present in our literature. So this was a tweet that I wrote a little while ago based on some research I did um, where I, I ran into this firsthand. And so the tweet that they mentioned was, you know, we'd be further along if our environmental justice research, if we didn't spend so much time trying to prove that racial disparities exist in environmental quality, it's been over 30 years. And my response to that says, you know, this seems to be a thing across areas of sociology and really across the social sciences. Um, it's hard to write for justice when the first half of every article is forced to answer the question. I wonder if there are racial, racial disparities. I don't know. Let's find out. And that takes up two thirds of your paper. And I ran in this, into this specifically because um, in a, a piece that I had done that I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, uh, uh, the, the paper initially was focusing on racial disparities in teachers' perceptions. And I remember uh, the person saying, well, I think your findings are really saying that teachers are mostly accurate, not that they are inaccurate, right? So there was this focus on like, you are being biased by trying to start with there's racism and then exploring it rather than saying, I wonder if there is racism. What ended up happening is two thirds of my paper went to answering the question, I wonder if there's racism when I knew it, it was already there. And then this like little piece at the end, was where I finally got to actually, um, oops, sorry, make sure I go back a little bit, is where I actually got to address, oh yeah, there's racism. Because the reality is that, you know, numbers are tools. They need to be contextualized. They do not speak for themselves. And racism is a central factor. And when we're using numbers, we need to speak to the way um, race is infused in our decision-making about our, our numbers and the contextualization of those numbers. So for example, so here's a, a finding, let me just right here, a finding from a paper I did in 2015 in social science research. Um, this was the same paper where I was told I needed to spend a lot of time thinking about teachers being accurate first. And so the whole first part of the paper is about accuracy. But then I'm like, guess what? There's inaccuracy too. The interesting thing in, in um, this particular paper though, was that um, most people had done, uh, uh, looked at uh, teachers, disparities in teachers' perceptions, looking at groups collectively instead of thinking of contextualizing how racism happens. And I, and I said, you know, but teachers don't look at students that are high achieving and think the same things as when they're low achieving in terms of their performance on tests. I wonder, how that would differ given what we know about the way teachers racialize students and the kinds of stereotypes and schemas they draw from. And so I looked at teachers' perceptions and disparities across the achievement scale and discovered that what looked like a zero effect was actually a, uh, um, an opposite effect on the polar ends that averaged out to zero when you look at an average effect, where at the lower end of the achievement scale, a uh, uh, Black uh, non-white Latinx students and Asian students were actually seen um, as uh, uh, doing better, received higher, you know, kind of, uh, or were rated less, less negatively it is, right? Less negatively, so more positively than white students as the baseline. But at the top of the achievement scale, uh, uh, these students of color were actually rated more negatively than white students, right? And it averaged out to zero. There was no contextualization in the research to understand the way we think about those interactions and how that, that shapes how we see racism happen. So another way that I've thought about this is in this idea about groups, how we categorize, right? Groups, you know, in Quant uh, Crit, they'll talk about this idea that groups are neither natural nor given, right? The way we do quant research and measurement, there's a complex, historically situated, contested history 
to racism that most people don't realize. You know, our first racial categories to do the, a very like two minute history lesson were actually created by a sweet, Swedish botanist, Carl Linnaeus. You may recognize him because he wrote the systems of nature. So, you know, genus, species, all these kinds of things we remember from maybe biology class. He created that classification system. In his 10th edition in 1735, he also added categories of man, Americanus, Asiaticus, Afro, and Europaeus. And in this work, he not only talked about categories, he talked about these groups based both on per appearance and personality. So for example, for, uh, uh, for Black, he said uh, uh, they were phlegmatic, unemotional, and stolidly calm disposition, relaxed, crafty, indolent, or lazy, negligent, anoint self with grease, and governed by impulsivity. So this is one description. This was for every group. There's a description, right, that really ties to stereotypes that we could still think of now. When we talk about the Europeans, though, he says white, sanguine, so optimistic, muscular, gentle, acute, perceptive, and inventive, covered with close vestments, governed by laws, rules, and regulations, right? So even in the 1700s, creating categories that we now recognize that actually come from a history of pseudoscience, and we still draw from those same stereotypes and ideas even now. To go even further, we've had a number of court cases that have continued to decide race, particularly for, um, for Asians and Latinx populations. Like for example, the, um, the very first court case was specifically of, of uh, um, a native Chinese person named Ayip in 1878, who was trying to, um, to, uh, uh, be, to be designated as white so he could gain citizenship. And in this case, the Supreme Court justices actually turned to Carl Linnaeus's grouping of categories to argue that he was, he was not Caucasian, but instead Mongolian, and that then he could not have whiteness and could not have citizenship. The interesting thing is that uh, following this, there was um, other cases, and in these cases, uh, uh, they would change their story. So for example, in a case in 1920, of Bagat Thind, where the, they, the uh, Thind was arguing, well, I am from the Caucasus Mountains, I'm South Asian, I'm Caucasian. And in this particular position, uh, petition, they then turned to the science, but in a different way. They said, yes, it may be true that you have the same blood, but the average man knows perfectly well that there, is, um, that there are unmistakable and profound differences between people today, and that uh, um, he could not be designated as white because he does not look like he is white to the average white person, right? And so we have this whole history of designating for Mexicans, for Latinx populations, for um, Black populations, and even for white populations. And all of these have really shaped my thinking around like, how do we decide what race is and how do we measure it? Who is Latinx and can Latinos be white? Right, so I'm showing you some actors and actresses thinking about like physicals of Pope, right? Uh, um, other ones who are Black Latino, who we don't even, a lot of these, I think this is what we got, Lupita Nyong'o, Cardi B, Zoe Saldano, Tessie Thompson, people that don't even realize are Latinx, right? And a lot of this drove my thinking along with thinking about this idea of hypo-descent, of whether one drop rule means that you're Black or if you're Asian and white, does that mean you're treated like you're Asian? has shaped how I thought about multidimensional measures of race, right? And for multidimensional measures of race, which I've written in, in um, I wrote in a 2015 piece for Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, I was really thinking about um, multidimensionally, multidimensionality vis-a-vis -vis race, thinking about the complex nature of race and racialization, right? The process of categorizing and assigning racial meaning uh, or value to physical, cultural, and social status markers. And then also this between and within category distinctions that inform classification and category, drawing from intersectionality. And so I talk about regarding this, um, you know, this multidimensional measure as indicative of a complex racialized classification system. Think about how we classify on the ground and how that can help inform our thinking. So in this piece, I had multiple racialized categories and I go through details of how I categorize, how I draw from theory to categorize, and then show the findings. And in here, I show a couple of different things. 
I'm able to show that in certain intersections of race, ethnicity, immigration status, these kind of racialized multidimensionality of race, there aren't differences. Like for example, I didn't find many differences in teachers' perceptions of approaches to learning between black immigrants and black Americans, even though I found huge differences uh, between the um, immigrants and Americans among Latinx and Asian populations where immigration was closely tied to how they are racialized. And so understanding those differences can give us a sense of how, look at this right here, right? Uh, Southeast Asian immigrants, white Latinx immigrants, non-white Latinx immigrants, these positive perceptions that did not hold for their third generation and beyond American counterparts um, when it came to positive perceptions of approaches to learning. I found similar patterns for externalizing problem behaviors. Um, and I also found really interesting within subgroup patterns. So in another paper that I published in 2019, I looked at mathematics and this idea of the model minority myth and found that East Asian immigrants drove the overwhelming majority of the my model minority myth positive attitudes of teachers in terms of mathematics. The idea being that East Asian immigrants both embody the phenotypic and cultural markers that teachers most associate with the kinds of racialized ideas about who is good at math. Right. And so rather than thinking that all Asian students were benefiting from it, I was able to show that actually um, there were certain Asian students that were and that it dropped off by the third generation. And then also thinking about this idea of um, controlling for um, controlling for race. Right. So in the research there and I'm trying to sorry, just scroll down in my notes so I have it real quickly. Um, so in the research. There is analysis claiming that we can control for these separate influences, these factors, and somehow will then control away race. They're trying to supposedly disentangle, right, these different things. The problem with this work is that it ignores the fact that all those things are race. If I control for something that happened before, that I'm controlling away for racism, right? So to act like I'm going to get this sliver of racism here while I'm controlling away SES differences, um, previous opportunity or all these different kinds of things, I'm actually removing racism from my model and then saying that there's no racism, right? Because that's what I'm doing when I'm controlling for these things and ignoring how embedded they are in the process that leads to present inequalities. So for example, um, I wrote a piece and published in 2019 an educational researcher on looking at transferring and dropping out in college for different major groups, right? And we were looking at these different patterns and identifying STEM as this kind of unique place where black students would transfer and drop out. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this is that we, we talk about controlling for things in this model, right? So we've got baseline differences, student and school demographics, and then ah, academic preparation, which is where people in education love to say, I've controlled you know, for things and now there's no racism, even though we did find some disparities. But we did some very simple wording differences to account for what we were doing. When we did our actual, um, our actual write-up, instead of saying we were controlling for academic ability or even academic pre preparation, we said we controlled for previous opportunity hoarding and racism, right? The idea being that students don't come to college with equal preparation because they had equal opportunities, experiences, and interactions with the world, right? And so when we're controlling for those things, we're not actually looking at the same kinds of students because if a student has experienced racism accumulatively up to that point, that we are not looking at the same students and that we need to acknowledge that that controlling is not some kind of inherent ability, but rather a reflection of all the previous racism they've experienced before this moment even occurred, right? So I, I actually left my slides there and I'm gonna stop there because uh, Dr. Suzuki has lots of other things to talk about, but I think the point of the, um, of what I wanted to do very briefly, I know I didn't have much time, was just introduce you to some of these ideas and thinking that shape how people move forward in, in research, this idea that when we stop thinking, we can be objective and understand that we bring perceptions, we bring perspectives, we bring our own racialized socialization to the table, that we need to constantly be reflecting on that in how we do everything from our frameworks of orientation of whether there's no racism versus whether there's racism, right? And our thinking around measurement about categories and lived experience. And also things like 
controlling for variables? What does it mean to actually control for something? Um, so with that, I wanna thank you again for having me and close out with that. Thank you, Dr. Irizarry. Um, Dr. Suzuki, um, whenever you're ready. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and we're gonna have Q and A at the end of both of these, just as a reminder. Okay. So I have some slides here that um, has some overlap with uh, Dr. Rosary's work, but um, I wanted to share um, what I've been learning about this framework um, called QuantCrit. It is uh, sort of a label that has been put on, um, on work around doing quantitative research critically that has a very long history. Um, and I actually, came into this framework through seminars during grad school and have been um, doing a lot of thinking about how it can be applied to research uh, that we do every day, as well as applied to uh, the teaching of statistics. So uh, in this brief presentation, I'd uh, really love to share with you all um, some foundations building on uh, Yasmin's uh, work about why we need QuantCrit, and then explore what the framework of QuantCrit is. And then I'd, I, I'd really like to um, dedicate the most time to sharing some uh, thinking that I've been doing about how we can actually do QuantCrit in our everyday research practices. So why do we need QuantCrit? I think uh, to understand why there's this need for a critical approach to using quantitative methodologies. We really have to look back at the reason why um, the, statistical the statistical techniques that we are using today were developed. So a lot of the statistics that we use in the social sciences were developed by uh, white men, uh, whose names you'll probably recognize from your you know, statistics learning, uh, people like Pearson, Galton, and those uh, techniques were really being developed um, to advance eugenicist goals. Um, you know, a lot of the core uh, quantitative tools that we use in the social sciences from t-tests to ANOVA and correlations were designed by scholars like Galton, Fisher, um, and of course Pearson, and they were all really ardent eugenicists. Um, you know, for example, Pearson founded the journal uh, the Annals of Eugenics, which has now been renamed to the Annals of Human Genetics. Um, but Francis Galton um, wrote books such as The Passing of the Great Race, which was considered um, a Bible to Hitler. And this photograph, uh, by the way, is showing Pearson on the left and Galton on the right. And one way that I've been thinking about how um, this, these core ideas of eugenics shows up in statistics is uh, the idea of homogeneous data or homogeneity of variance, right? That groups should be pure and free of deviance. Um, that is an idea that is really central to statistics. We try to remove outliers, we tr uh, try to have homogeneity of variance. And we can see um, through some of these ideas how the uh, eugenicist goals of these statistical tools um, were foundational. And, you know, we're here about a century later, and when I do a quick search and, for example, psych info, um, we still see today that a lot of the uh, white dominance ideology within statistics really permeates um, our statistical tools. Um, on this slide, I'm just uh, threw up some figures that I found in different journals. Uh, on psych info, and we see that we are making these comparisons between um, black people and uh, white people, and that this is a very common practice that we engage in uh, in statistics and the social sciences. And I'm not here to say that we should never make uh, racial comparisons. There are cases that are that they are justified and that um, there is an important reason for doing racial comparisons. And actually, Dr. Moin Syed has a great paper um, discussing this point of when racial comparisons are needed uh, to advance social justice goals. But in many studies um, in the social sciences, we 
compare racial groups in ways that are simply advancing what uh, scholars like Tuku Fuzuberi and Eduardo Bonilla Silva call uh, the advancement of white logic and white methods. So, um, you know, when we're when we compare explicitly to racial groups to each other, or when we do things like controlling for race in our models, what we're actually really doing is saying that we can uh, quantify and sometimes parcel out this effect of race. Um, and you know, Zuberi and Bonilla Silva's uh, volume "White Logic, White Methods" really asks us to reflect on what exactly we're quantifying when we conduct these methodological moves of comparison and controlling for effects of race. Um, you know, in the social sciences, we agree that race is a social construct and that it is fluid over space and time. Uh, definitions of race change and different groups are racialized um, in different ways. It's a, it's a continuously contested uh, space, yet um, we, we do these uh, maneuvers in our statistics as if race is a solid sort of categorical construct. And further, even if um, we have a solid grounding for, um, you know, controlling for race, what does it really mean when we find an effect of race? For example, say that we conducted some analysis and find that um, black youth are, you know, five times more likely to have a certain type of school outcome. Um, how are we to interpret this effect of race? Um, we cannot and should not be standing on racist logic, such as that their skin color or um, something inherent about them made them more likely to be disciplined. And so what Zuberi and Eduardo Bolina Silva and others um, other scholars of critical quantitative methods are saying is that we need to, instead of examining the effects of race, focus on racial relations or more specifically racism. And when um, we say uh, that these scholars are taking a critical approach to quantitative methodology, what we're really referring to is critical theory coming from the Frankfurt School. And this is a philosophical approach that responded to social issues um, at that time, such as Nazism and other uh, fascist ideologies. And critical theories stood apart from what was the dominant way of doing social theory at that time, which was to explain society or describe social phenomena. Instead, critical theory is about um, supporting social transformations through theory. So you would analyze uh, forces of oppression, uh, the balance of power and critique it. And so a critical theory is not just about explaining how society is, but explaining how society could be or should be. And um, as Dr. Gazzini mentioned, it's uh, rooted in um, an epistemology that is different to uh, positivism, which uh, underlies statistical work. Building on our critical theories in general, legal scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw developed critical race theory. And critical race theory is really the foundational um, theory for quant crit. So critical race theory highlights the centrality of racism in everyday life. It critiques liberal ideologies like race neutrality and meritocracy. And through taking a critical approach to understanding racial relations in society, critical race theory argues that the power to narrate, um, for example, that racism is over or that we are past race is something that must be dismantled. And for critical race theories, an important methodological emphasis is placed on uplifting the narratives of people of color that counter dominant narratives, uh, their counter stories. So going back uh, to the agenda, what is this framework that we call quant crit? So this phrase quant crit was originally coined by Dr. David Gilborn, who's a race scholar in the UK, and it refers to the framework of applying critical theory or critical race theory uh, specifically to quantitative work. And the style of the term is really paying homage to many uses of the uh, 
crit phrasing in derivatives of critical race theory. And uh, the, the framework has really been developed by scholars like Dr. Nicole Garcia and Nancy Lopez as well. Uh, and in their work, they laid out several tenets or principles of quant crit. And these principles really mirror and build on the core principles of critical race theory. So the first principle we have again, the centrality of racism. And in quant crit, it is saying that racism is also central to quantitative methods. We now know, you know the racist history of these methods and uh, the, how the normal usage of these methods might be steeped in white logic. Um, and so we can uh, think about how uh, numbers can never be neutral because they are uh, presented, filtered through our human interpretations and biases. Quancrete also calls into question the idea that people can be neatly categorized, especially based on a white dominant perspective. So we talk about race um, being socially constructed. We talk about uh, non-binary gender identity. And so we have to be able to critique the idea that there are natural or immutable categories of individuals that can be dictated by those who hold most power. Um, Quancrete, like critical race theory, also um, argues that voice and insight are really vital, especially the voice and insight of those who hold counter narratives, and that their voice is vital to the interpretation of data. And lastly, as Quancrete is ultimately um, a form of critical theory, it's about using theory not to just describe things as they are, but to find ways to use numbers for social justice and social transformation. So what does it look like to be doing quant crit in our everyday research practice? Uh, that's something that I've been thinking about uh, and wrote a paper recently uh, with Dr. Johnson and Dr. Morris about how to apply quant crit in our work. And we identified these three key moments that uh, often occur during the research process. And we represented them uh, in the circular diagram because research moments are really iterative and they're not uh, research never really occurs in a linear fashion. Um, but in the time that I have left, I want to go into two of these moments and sort of discuss uh, what it might look like to be doing quant crit in your work. So in the first moment um, of research, what often happens is you're developing the research question and you're identifying analysis variables. Um, Quantcrete principles like using numbers for social justice and acknowledging the centrality of racism means that we must examine why we are motivated to pursue certain research topics and studies. Um, in the qualitative fields, this is very common uh, to engage in practices such as positionality and self-reflexivity, but we sort of assume that uh, when it comes to quantitative research, that this is suddenly no longer necessary, that we come with this unbiased um, view to quantitative work. Uh, and so in this green box, um, I'm presenting some common reflexivity questions that qualitative researchers engage in. And I uh, would argue that doing quant crit means that you engage with these questions when you're doing quantitative practice as well. So questions like, um, what do I hope to accomplish by conducting this study and for who? Are there specific career goals or milestones or specific organizations that I'm trying to support with my research? Um, these sort of self-reflexive questions are important for quantitative work as well. Another part of uh, this first moment in research is identifying the analysis variables of our research. And this is really about taking a critical approach to measurement and thinking really carefully about underlying assumptions behind the constructs that we're interested in and any potential bias or assumptions in the measures that we're going to use to capture those constructs. So how were the measures validated, um, in what samples and to what end? Those are questions that we can ask um, at the measurement stage. So I'm gonna to turn to the second moment 
which is when um, we as researchers might make decisions about the role of race in our plan analyses. So following the quant crit tenets about the centrality of racism and the constructed nature of categories, a core goal in moment two might be to question the assumptions about analyzing an effect of race. So here's um, an example that I wanted to dig into. Um, so we see, uh, we've heard many um, scholars, including Dr. Fauci, saying at the during the pandemic that, um, you know, black and brown people, uh, it's very sad. It's nothing we can do about it right now, except to try and give them the best possible care to avoid those complications. And these statements were about how uh, black and brown bodies were having higher mortality rates and that they were getting sicker during the pandemic. And when we dig into this, uh, we can see how such a framing uh, that's focused on individual level explanations really can perpetuate a narrative that um, some people are somehow inherently more unhealthy and inferior. It's an individual level explanation that blames the person. And when you really get down to it, it's a cultural or biological race effect explanation. So when you have something like this, you can instead um, turn to examining the structural causes behind the differential impacts of uh, things like the coronavirus. We can look at racial relations in the US, such as the segregation of communities that lead to poor living conditions, uh, poor access to medical uh, care and healthy food, and how those racial relations contribute to poor health outcomes among people of color. And taking that even further, we can think about the racism that leads to racial stratification, right? So segregation does not just happen uh, without human interference. It is a direct byproduct of racist policies and behaviors such as redlining, um, predatory rending by banks and uh, you know, white people taking actions uh, like white flight. And so the idea that people of color are more vulnerable to the uh, coronavirus, uh, we can reveal that it's not a race effect. It's simply masking um, a racism effect. Another way to uh, interrogate the use of uh, race in our analyses is to try and instead think um, about, instead of examining the effect of race, we might explore variation within similar groups, including groups that are racialized in similar ways. So this is an approach that I often use uh, in my work and uh, is supported by the statistical approach of mixture modeling. Um, and we may turn to mixture modeling to combat the deficit-based narratives about people of color and about young uh, black and brown people um, and how they are compared to standards of being white or being cisgendered and so on. Uh, so I want to end with this example um, what, that used mixture modeling. This study was by Romero and Amali, and they were examining uh, perceptions of school climate among Latinx youth. So the dom a dominant perspective uh, in their field on school climate is that Latinx youth have low school climate views and that it's a problem. And so they wanted to challenge this perspective and look more closely at variation within Latinx youth. So what they did is they conducted a, a mixture model, a latent profile analysis with different aspects of school climate perceptions and found uh, these five different profiles. And what their analyses were showing that, yes, there are Latinx youth who have poor school climate perceptions, but there were also students with high school climate perceptions and that those Latinx youth who had high school climate perceptions reported that they felt they had a role in making decisions about their school experience. So this within group analysis reveals that um, you cannot sort of write off all Latinx youth as having poor school climate views. And it also points to a direct way to foster positive school climate among uh, these young people. And I will end there uh, to leave time for questions. Thank you so much.
thanks to you both, Yasmin and, and Sarah. Um, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm very impressed how you were able to stop before time. And I'm, I'm one of those scholars that just can keep on going on and on. And I could see the hook trying to pick me off the stage. That's usually so, <laughs> so with that said, so thank you for you both for real. I, I, we, we, we appreciate the, the, the information and I had a very strong feeling that this was not gonna overlap at all and it soon did not. So um, this is the time for a Q and A for our esteemed colleagues and our guests. Um, I think it would be really informative. I have, I have tons of questions, but I really wanna open up to everyone else um, to start off. And I guess also remind everybody that we're meeting with grad students for a while afterwards. So you have us. So um, <laughs> that's right. Have us past the, when the faculty are gone, right? So <laughs> that's right. Feel free to ask okay. now, but also if you want to say for then, you're welcome to. Well, I'll start off with a question so I can jump in. So I guess for me, one of the things that's been really interesting that both of you um, have brought up, but I've been struggling with, especially as, a, as, as someone who does this kind of work. I mean, how uh, the assumption of, and, and this is something I learned early on and, and, and something I still try to struggle with in terms of how do I mentor uh, graduate students, that the assumption is you need to prove race and race, like you have to prove racism, right? Like the assumption is that we have to take that step first <laughs> um, rather than trying to, and then not only that, reviewers will also assume like these measurements are by default um, the standard and not problematic, how we think about race, how we measure race to um, how do we control for race and all these other aspects of things that are associated with race, if not deeply embedded or connected with race. But I'm, I'm also talking about with gender, I, with gender um, intersectionality, all these things, right? So even, even the concept of, um, so I, I have tons of questions. So, but let me start off with that in terms of how would you then inform a grad student or let's say someone who's entering this work, how do you then make the leap, which different disciplines uh, are willing to, to take on in terms of the assumption, like you don't have to prove racism. You can start off with the assumption that racism is real um, and then move from there. I guess, I guess my question is, how do you, yeah. how do you move forward with your work for both of you? Oof. If I could jump in this first, because this was a hard one for me. I, you know, I, I, I guess I was a late bloomer with my research and I didn't understand why I would get these reviews and they would say I was biased and I would get them. I, I mean, I remember having, and so I finally started getting traction. I had two articles out on, on the same kind of multidimensional on like teachers' perceptions, but different aspects. One was a social science research, one is sociology of education. And I had done the revision of social education, sent it off, and then happened to attend AERA, where I'm headed to shortly, and got to meet with a scholar, Frank Worrell, um, who's a psychologist, development, I think does developmental psychology. And he had been assigned to me to read one of my papers and give me feedback. And he was the first person that sat me down and was like, this is why you're being called biased. And he was like, look right here at this wording. He said, they want you to start from a framework of neutrality, of there being nothing, as though that is the null hypothesis, as though there's something, you know, like that is where the beginning point is. And all of a sudden it clicked, not because I agreed with that position. In fact, I very much disagreed with it, but at least I now knew why I was being called bias and what I was up against when I was publishing my work. And in fact, that was, I was up against, I, so I rewrote the entire paper, sent it to my advisor, and he looked at it and went, what happened? It was like a totally different paper. Cause I was like, oh, I know what they want. They want me to start with no racism. I got it. And I like created this whole, it was really a facade to try to finally have the discussion I wanted to have because they wanted this perception that like racism did exist in a world where literally there's a body of research a million miles long about racism, right? And so it, it to me, it was ridiculous, but I knew who was reviewing my work and I knew that that is the, perception of where they started with. And so the difficulty I've run into since then is making decisions about how do I continue to send my work to places where, so that the people that I believe need to read it, read it, rather than sending it to like black studies journals and to, not that those aren't good outlets, but those aren't the people that need to be reading the stuff that I write. 
um, really is the people that are writing in social bed and in um, you know, social science research and in, in you know, kind of social scientists. And so I've had to really fight this and some of the fighting hasn't been a, a, a you know, kind of giving in, but rather a fighting in the field. So like I was really, uh, I, I helped organize the first pre-conference on, on race and racism in the sociology of education. And it was a pre-conference for, a, for ASA that we did a whole day long. And Adam Gamron, the, who's uh, the president, I think he's still the president of um, William T. Grant Foundation, he attended. And I remember one of his students came to me that evening. He had won a career award and they ran to me and they said, Adam Gamron said white supremacy. They had never heard him say this before. And they're like, Adam Gamron said it. And they were like, he was scribbling notes earlier. Being present at that place shifted his thinking around race and has shifted his funding. Like I see now a big shift in who he funds and the kinds of work and where their orientation and starting point is. And so while we're still fighting this, we do, we fight the reviewers who say, you need to start with no racism, but racism is a fact of life. It literally is embedded in everything. I think a better starting point is there is racism. Prove me there's not. Like, I'm like, prove me where it isn't because it literally is cumulative and everywhere. I can point you, you give me a situation and I can tie race in. And so then the question is, prove to me it's not. I think that's just as fair of a starting point as the other way around. And so in the meantime, while I'm trying to get people to see that that's just an orient, that's a race, you know, a white supremacist orientation to believe that there's somehow something more inherently supreme about starting with nothing than something when we, when we have evidence that it exists. Um, and, but while we're doing that, we have to find ways to also be savvy in how we write and be selective in where we send our, you know, papers and in all these other kinds of strategies to deal with the very system we're writing about, because that, what, that's what it is. We write about it and it's the same system that's shaping who reviews our papers, where they get published, the gatekeeping and so on and so forth. Well, thank you, Yasmin. I mean, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that because I have a different question for you, but go ahead. Yeah, no, one thing that I think about um, a lot is quant crit as sort of a praxis that you are engaging in with the academy, not just in individual projects that you're working on. So I think that, um, you know, like Yasmin's pointing to, like you have to be uh, bringing these up in conversations with people who are editors and journals uh, when you're at conferences and when you are in these spaces of academia where, um, because it's the whole system, right? It's not just going to show up in your statistical methods and your stats classes and your research projects. It's, it's, um, it colors how papers get reviewed. It colors who gets funded. Um, I think as a junior scholar, one way that I've found success in and sort of getting around this um, requirement of like proving first that there is racism is saying that I am taking like a strength-based perspective and um, focusing on the strengths of certain groups that have always been painted in a deficit perspective. So I, I also, um, you know, criticize that as well, right? Because why is it, um, you know, I study critical consciousness and one thing I grapple with a lot is why is it on the people of color to be Critical con critically conscious, to be engaged in activism? Why is it all on them to be dismantling the systems that are oppressing them? But what I found also that is that uh, reviewers and the field um, take well to a framing of, I'm gonna present research that is about, um, you know, people of color sort of, and their strengths to dismantle oppression and their strengths to fight uh, white supremacy and that that framing sort of um, gets me away from having to discuss that um, racial disparities exist. So it's not a perfect way. And I, um, like Asmin, have these internal battles of, hey, I'm going, you know, doing some things in order to get my work out there. Um, but it is one way that I, I think it works. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to have, oh, Roy, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I know we're short on time. I wanted to, if we had a moment, I'll ask another one, but if not. Okay. No, go ahead. We got time. And, 
and sorry for the no camera working today. Um, thank you both, uh, terrific presentations. Um, I have a million questions, but I'll try to keep it to one that I think might be used to, not just me selfishly uh, in my work. Uh, could you comment on how you think methods training moving forward uh, should change um, in you know, however many few minutes we have left? Ooh, this is, I mean, this is something I've actually been working on. I'm act, I've been for years, I came, so I'm in a black studies department and I was the first quant person hired in my department. We're one of the largest in the country and we have playwrights and we had no quantitative folks. And I somehow convinced them that guess what? The core of black studies was Ida B. Wells and Du Bois. And Du Bois wrote uh, his, uh, a, a critical methodological piece in 1896 on trying to root things in history and racism and these things, you know, which was extremely critical for the moment, given where sociology was at that time, right, in the social sciences. And I somehow convinced them of that. We've got a demographer, another sociologist who actually was a student of Takufu Zuberi's, and I'm, I think I'm like third gen Takufu Zuberi, um, and... Uh, uh, and we're now recruiting a fourth and we're actually building up a whole program around training in, in, in critical, you know, critical quant crit kind of like methodologies and statistics in black studies because there's a need for it. And right now, I mean, I hope in the long run that we could have what we have, but that there's also a, a stronger and better training um, in programs. I think the starting point for that is especially in programs where people learn data sciences and statistics and they don't get any kind of orientation, they're handed data and then told analyze as though the numbers are truths and already there for them and ready to go and they can just study them. They not only do they not even learn about thinking about their own orientation, but they don't even think critically about what they were handed before they start analyzing it, right? And and so we, I mean, in some departments, we have lots of ways to go. Because if we're there, if you're starting with, there's like this truth and this data that somehow appeared magically to you that you don't even think about how they, you know, went about doing things, let alone think about where you're at and in, in, in your own kind of uh, a framing and understanding of the work, then you're literally just running statistics. And as Sarah's mentioned, that statistics has a long sordid history, right? And so um, in programs like that, they, there needs to be much more grounding. In the social sciences, uh, there needs to be more letting go of, you know, listen, we're not in the 1800s. We don't have to hug positivism and the scientific method to get people to believe that our statistics are statistics. Like, uh, you know, that was a strategy to try to like align the social sciences with the physical sciences and biological sciences as a way to give it more legitimacy. And um, like, we can let go of that. <laughs> it's time to let go of that and build our own kind of paradigms around how we approach numbers. Um, but there's still this kind of like hugging of it as though like maybe the economists will love us if we do this. Maybe the biologists or the, I don't know, the, the engineers will love us if we do this. And I, they don't care any more or less. Thanks, Yasmin. How, how about you, uh, Sarah? Yeah, just two words. Uh, teach that sordid history. Uh, I think white supremacy is all about a contextual, a historical and you can really disrupt that in your classes by uh, engaging with that history. Thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah, thank um, you. Go ahead, Roy. No, just expressing my thanks. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I apologize to everyone because I know I'm one that usually starts off, it's usually my fault that we start off late, um, but I want to thank everyone for sticking around and um, receiving our guest lectures, our guest speakers here um, to, to share the knowledge that they've been able. So thank you to you both, Yasmin and Sarah. It's a different link for the grad students. So uh, we're gonna go switch over, switch over now. So thank you once again, and um, I'm gonna make it available to your emails and remind everyone how to get in contact with you if they have any further questions. Um, so thanks again to you both. And um, yeah, we're gonna switch over, switch over link. Okay, I'm gonna go All right. hunt for it right now. Okay. All right, just just email me and I can forward you the, the link too if, it, if, you, if you don't have it. Okay. All right, thanks and take care. Bye-bye everyone.